Okay, well, um, welcome to session five. Uh, it's already been five weeks that we've been having class. <clears throat> and so um, I've been giving you lots of assignments and readings and we've had speakers. And so I thought, let's take today to sort of slow down just a little bit, kind of catch up on some details. And um, I've been reading your experience reports and you guys are doing such cool things on your farms. I'm reading about um, mushroom inoculation. I had to look up the word for the sterilization process that you used, Clara. Um, I've been reading about Devin's uh, buckwheat taste testing project and camelina projects. Um, so I thought we could take some time today to share with our classmates what we've been learning and doing on our farms, as well as uh, catching up on some program details and talking about your independent projects. In that vein, your check-in statement or your check-in question is, what is one success or accomplishment from the last week? Sorry. Might as well. I said I can go first. Okay. Um, so I guess one of my, I, I've been doing a lot of things here at DCB Farms and I have two different things I'd like to mention. So the first is I've pretty much gotten my own high tunnel to work in. We haven't gotten it planted yet, but we have, we had to till it just to get it, everything prepared. And I was the one doing all of that. So that was one accomplishment I did. And another one is um, I've been working on a worm, um, a continuous flow worm bin. So it should help us with a lot of our worm needs, some of our composting. So we finally got our worms in uh, Thursday? Yeah, Thursday. So we were really excited. Uh, I believe April uh, posted it on the DCB Facebook too. So that would be my accomplishments. Awesome. I will have to go check out that post. Uh, Natalie, would you like to go? Sure, yeah. So I guess like an overall success that I had was last week was like my first week of working in the garden. So that was just like successful overall, just meeting everyone. And then a smaller success would be, we just got like everything we kind of wanted to get done, done like watered plants, transplanted plants, like took plants that died and put new seeds in. And yeah, it was all just really successful. So that was great. Mine's honestly similar to Natalie, but like I got all the weeds picked in the first garden and that felt so nice. So now I can take it easier on the weeds the next couple of days. Wonderful. You got some great weeding experience in. Yeah, I've actually been identifying them too with like my app because I want to kind of do my independent project on identifying like different weeds and stuff in the garden because I know not all of them are bad. And maybe you don't even have to pick all of them. So I kind of just want to look more into that. Yeah. Um, that reminds me, I've been taking notes as I read through your experience reports about like resources I could share that are aligned with your interests. And um, we have a video recording of a webinar that actually is one that I did um, a few years ago about edible weeds from your garden. So some recipes for purslane and lamb's quarters. Yeah, I actually got to try lamb's quarter for the first time, which I was like, you can eat a weed. Definitely. And uh, maybe Natalie has learned or will learn something from the New Americans in the in Growing Together Gardens about edible weeds too. Some of them have talked about eating uh, the amaranth. Yeah, definitely. And we're going to have like a cookbook meeting this week. So I'll definitely get to see more recipes that we've like started creating. Wonderful. Maybe, maybe if there's time, maybe Elise might be able to visit one of your gardens some night. Just I would love that. If that allows, since you're in Fargo. So. Well, um, Haley, what's one success or accomplishment from your week? Well, I don't know about the week because we just got back from our vacation last week, but since the last time that I was on, I learned and got to ride or drive a tractor 
which was kind of cool. <laughs> Um, and then we also transplanted all of our melons um, and it was kind of cool. I learned how to um, lay drip line and we pulled some water from the river that they have in the back um, to in a big tank that went into the drip line. So that was really, that was an accomplishment. Good learning task. How do they um, drive it through the drip line? Do they have a pump or is it gravity? There is a pump. Uh, there's a pump in the um, big barrel because they have, I believe. Very cool. Yeah. Great to have that river right there. I know. Uh, Gretchen, what's a success or accomplishment from your week? Uh, my independent project is working on chicken tractors, which are like a mobile chicken coop. And we just got the last one up and all the chickens moved out, which is very good. And then I've been working on some designs for feeders and waters that I'm just having a lot of fun with and really excited about. Very cool. And Devin. Um, my week has been interesting, but I've got uh, several accomplishments. I've, one of them is um, before, a few weeks before I laid a lot of drip line on some asparagus and that was good, but uh, it, well, the weeds loved it too. So we had to take those out and that was fun. That we also uh, like like uh, you said earlier. We've been doing um, buckwheat taste testing, and I've been learning about that. Um, and, and I've been uh, like uh, learning certain things. Like you can't tell the tasters what types, what what the actual types of buckwheat are, or that gives them somewhat of a bias to the name that they like. And using random numbers and something some of that stuff not having the numbers start with one because apparently there's a bias towards one yeah but that was all really interesting and fun yeah who is doing the tasting um mostly my family right now um although i think at one point we had someone else and then uh we i also baked and ground some buckwheat for a chef who's also planning on uh doing some of the test tasting. Yeah. Great. Uh, and now I'm just asking, cause I'm curious, cause I'm a baker myself. Is this hull, is it hulled or does it have the hull on when you're grinding it? It still has the hull on, yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, I'm excited to see what you all do with the buckwheat because that's uh, something I was working on myself at one time was buckwheat pancakes because my husband can't eat gluten. Mm. And yeah, I was surprised on how easy they are to make. And yeah, they, the buckwheat pancakes were are fun. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to touch on some upcoming events that I want to make sure you're all aware of. Um, and then I'm going to skip ahead to the farm tour as well. Um, so in your portal, you will see upcoming events in the, um, in the, when you log in your like homepage. Um, so it shows, oops, that's why we're at farmer's market. There we go. <clears throat> so it shows that today your weekly report was due. Our class is on check-in and reflection. Um, tomorrow is the uh, monthly meeting of the North Dakota Local Food Development Alliance. Um, remember the session on local food systems, I brought in Felicity Merritt to talk about the Local Food Development Alliance. So um, if you're available at two o'clock, you're welcome to join that meeting. It's free, it's open to everybody. We're going to be learning about a rural grocer's uh, like cooperative that's starting up north of Grand Forks and just um, updates from across the local food system in North Dakota. And those are always recorded too. And, and again, this isn't a requirement. These are just for your information if it's something that interests you. Also this week on Wednesday, um, Farms is putting on a webinar called Success Strategies for North Dakota Farmers Market Vendors. So um, 
This is for anybody who's thinking about vending at a farmer's market, um, who wants to learn tips and tricks to have a successful season. Um, again, it's not a requirement, but if, if you're gonna be helping vend at the farmer's market and you're interested in learning what it's like, or you think you wanna be a farmer's market vendor yourself someday, um, there'll be lots of great um, ideas in this webinar. We're having six uh, local farmers market vendors and market managers speak. So you'll hear Annie from Red River Market, um, Caitlin, who's from a farmers market in the far southwest corner of the state at uh, actually in Lemon, South Dakota, but just across the border. And then um, Adam Mobby is a meat producer who vends at farmers markets. And um, Christy, I forget her last name, uh, has Due North gluten-free goods and she vends at Town Square Market. So Gretchen might have met her or maybe you will see her this summer. Um, I'm Christy. And we've got two others. Oh, Lori from Bismarck and shoot. Oh, Peggy from Minot. So um, the link to register for that is in your portal under the, if you just hover over the name and click, you can register, or you can watch the live stream on Facebook on Wednesday at noon. And again, this will be recorded as well. And then the last upcoming event is not one of ours, so it didn't show up here, but um, there's a farm tour at Minokin Farm on June 22nd, but they want you to register by the 15th. So if you were interested in driving to, and we will be doing our own tour to Minokin Farm later in the summer. So um, this is just optional if you're interested. Are there any other upcoming events that, that any of you want to share? We have our own upcoming event um, on the 28th. So that's this, this session, next week's session, and then that would be the week after that. So we're doing a farm tour or field day, whichever you want to call it, to um, four farms south of Fargo. Uh, Crooked Lane Farm is near Colfax. Uh, we'll start there for breakfast snacks and just gathering. And then we'll drive up to um, Family Roots Farm where Elise uh, is interning. And we'll get a tour of all the things that Jen has, uh, Jen and Elise are doing at Family Roots Farm. Um, then back down to Colfax for lunch. And then we will go down to Galchut, which is just a little bit south where there where 107 acres has an alpaca farm and hopefully we'll get to well we'll get to see the alpacas and hopefully their fiber mill as well I need to ask about that and then we will end our day back up at crooked lane farm and i believe get a tour of dakota vines winery which is next door um so first of all uh, if any of you have special dietary needs, please let me know. Um, they are providing lunch and breakfast and snacks in the afternoon. However, the menu is a toast bar with homemade wheat bread, rhubarb breads, and rhubarb sauce and jams for breakfast. Um, so if anybody's gluten-free, let me know so I can make sure to provide some gluten-free bread. Um, and then lunch is going to be chicken sandwiches and salad provided by Bill Herbs CSA. So um, again, if, if anybody is vegetarian or vegan, uh, let me know and we can make sure there's an alternative for lunch. Um, and then the afternoon snack also has gluten in it. Um, so, uh, and you can uh, put it in the chat if you're comfortable with that. You can private message me in the chat or you can shoot me an email and let me know. 
I just want to be sure everybody has something that they could eat and nobody's hungry. <laughs> Any questions about the farm tour? I'll, I'll be sending out more details later, but. Um, and I presume we need to bring water. Um, I mean, it's always good to bring water. They're going to have ice water and I am going to bring um, farms water bottles for everybody, refillable aluminum uh, metal water bottles. So there's that. But do dress for being outdoors, um, which I assume you do every day at your host farms. I, I guess uh, COVID stuff. Um, so at this point, you know, I, you know, the CDC has changed their guidelines so that if you have been immunized, you're not always required to wear a mask. Um, I'm assuming some of you may have and some of you may have not um, because you're all young and you're in the last category that was even eligible. So I'm at this point, I'm gonna put it on the honor system. I will have masks there. Um, I just encourage you to be considerate of others, but I'm not going to, you know, force anyone to, you know, do it. We're going to be outside most of the time. Um, so we should be able to, you know, maintain a safe social distance, you know, wash your hands. Don't breathe in people's faces, <laughs> you know, and just be considerate of the people around you. And I think we'll be fine. All I'm going to say is I'm sad that it's not the 24th. Oh, is that I'm sure you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, from fo for folks coming from Fargo, do we want to set up like a carpool system so we're not taking a million cars to one location? That would be cool because I also just like don't drive. Oh, girl, I got you. We'll get there. <laughs> Thanks. Um, do you need help with that or do you have it? Like, do you need your each other's contact info? Yeah, probably, right? Yeah, I'll have it. Is anyone else from Fargo would be interested in carpooling? I'm from Fargo too, yeah, that'd be cool. Okay, this is myself. So if everyone just like would text me, then we can figure it out. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I'll send out your email in the follow-up email to Haley or Clara. Um, I don't know. Oh, yeah, that wouldn't. I was going to say maybe the folks from Grand Forks want a carpool, but you've already driven down from Grand Forks to Fargo. Like, there's no point in parking in Fargo for the last, like, 15 miles. So, yeah. Um, that sounds great. I because we also have some driving to do during the day too, just because the farms are spread out a little bit. So I was trying to figure out how to reduce the number of cars moving around. So I think um, Josh and his host happen to live in Botno where I live. So I think the three of us will carpool and maybe I will rent a large type vehicle so that during the actual tours, we could maybe all fit into two vehicles or something. We'll work it out. Um, also want to make sure you all know that um, you do get mileage reimbursement, those of you that do the driving um, to attend field days. Um, and we have a form for that to submit those online. Where'd it go? It's Bitly Farms Expense Report. I'm going to put it in the chat. And this is the same form that you would use also to submit um, expenses for your independent projects. And I have added this to your um, resources list in your portal as well. Um, so you can always find it there also. So I emailed you the receipts a while back for the expense report. Do you want me to fill that form out or is it all okay? Um, you're fine. Okay. Because I, I hadn't, yeah, I've, I can, um, 
I'll work it out with my bookkeeper, but you're good. Um, but for your independent projects, um, I do need your supplies list beforehand so that I can prove it. And then when you submit for reimbursement, you do need to provide receipts for the things you purchased. And there's a place in that form where you can upload the receipts. And um, okay, one last detail. Um, so we talked about um, your paperwork, how you needed um, to submit a passport or two forms of ID to go with your I-9. Um, is there anyone who hasn't submitted those yet? I haven't. I just got hold of my passport and mailed it in yesterday, I think. So it should be there soon. Okay. I still need to get mine done with April. Okay. So um, those of you that haven't mailed it in yet, we now, I don't remember if I showed this to you last week, but if I did, I'm showing it to you again. In the portal on the left hand side, down here, there's a button that says upload. And you can, I, I told you you had to mail it in before because we didn't have a secure way. Now we have a secure way. This upload button is secure. So you can just upload those documents that way. Um, and it doesn't matter that they've got your social security and your bank account because this is a secure method. So that makes things a little easier for everybody. And then uh, Saturday was the last day of a pay period. So your time cards did disappear at noon today. And so I have them now. Um, so they, they all looked good. Um, if, you know, if by chance anybody missed any hours, let me know, but they looked like you'd submitted all your hours and were good. Have we gotten paid yet? Um, I don't, I haven't gotten anything except, well, yeah, that's, I haven't gotten anything. I don't think we had your pay, your paperwork. Okay. And so we weren't able to pay you at the last pay period. So if we have your paperwork by Wednesday, she'll be able to, um, cut your check for this pay period and any hours from the previous pay periods on Wednesday. Okay. Enough boring stuff. Um, I would like to hear about, um, okay, first question. Last week we talked about season extension and um, some of you talked with your host farmers and I saw your responses in the portal. So um, what, what kind of season extensions are your host farmers using? Um, we can popcorn this one. We don't have go, first, but, uh, go ahead. We don't have a ton at stable days, but they have um, a greenhouse and then they use grow lights in the kind of garage area to get seed started sooner. They don't do a lot for season extension like into the fall and winter though. Okay. Um, are they still doing uh, a, a hydroponic system? Um, they have one hydroponics up and running. The other two are currently empty. And they did run them through the winter last year. Okay. Yeah, last year. Uh, Josh, you were going to say something about DCD. Yeah. We have a lot of season extension and for good reason. Uh, we have greenhouses, high tunnels. Here we actually use more high tunnels than we do normal farm plots. So we have, to my knowledge, eight high tunnels, our large greenhouse. Uh, we use mulch, we use black plastic. We have hydroponics, aquaponics. Anything you can think of, we try to use here because we need as much as an extension as we can get. Definitely. Um, Elise, was it you who said that you were that you guys were going to put up a high tunnel soon? Yeah, the box is over there and ready, and like the posts are in. We just have to put it together to protect our garlic. 
awesome. All I will say for that is hope you can find people. We here at DCB have had a high tunnel kit that's been sitting around for I think two years now. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I wish I was. We used to do work projects as part of our farm tours. Maybe we should ask Jen if she wants to put us to work on the 28th. <laughs> you would love to. <laughs> we need a lot of help. It's just me and her. I'll, I'll talk with Jen. I don't, I don't know how long that'll take, if that'll like take up our whole day, but um, if we can help, that would be awesome. And great first hand. Well, our goal is to actually get everything done before the farm tour starts. So, okay. so we'll see. Okay. Um, anybody else get to experience some season extension on your farm? Um, my on my farm, farm is, oh, go ahead. My farm doesn't have too many things for season extension, but it does have a small greenhouse and um, it, yeah, that, um, that's, it's not, it doesn't have, it use season extension very much. Okay. Uh, was it Haley? I see it as well. Yeah, my farm, they're um, currently renting their land and hoping to purchase it. So they have a lot of ideas for high tunnels and things like that. They just have to wait to purchase the land. Um, but they do have a greenhouse that they use and they have a little, seed starting room off the garage that they will, they actually grew tomatoes and they're all winter long, um, that they'll grow stuff in and start seeds. So that's what they have right now, but they have a lot of, a lot of hope for the future if they can get that land. Yeah, well, I hope they can. Um, what about Clara? Um, I don't think they do too much to extend the season into the fall, but they do a lot to get a head start on spring to kind of like, be first to the market with a lot of different things. So starting like March, April-ish, they convert the cold storage room into like a seed incubator basically. And so it's like heated um, and then they like grow lights and stuff. So we'll start seed, like trays of seeds there. And then once they've grown up a little bit, they'll be moved to like a small greenhouse. And then once those are ready, then like, so when I started at the beginning of May, like we were already like putting things in the ground and then we do have a high tunnel and that's more for like, I mean, you can put seed, like more delicate seedlings in there. We just do tomatoes and peppers, but it's just more to like, they just grow better in those conditions, not necessarily like a season extension, but the plastic ripped off two weekends ago. And so it's just been in a frame for two weeks, but it's been 90 degrees. So like it hasn't really, made all that much of a difference. And I think they got a little bit of rain, which is good to kind of leach some of the salt out of the soil because it's been there for a few years now. So they replaced it on Saturday with some neighbor's help. So we're back in business. I think I saw the Facebook video. Were you part of that? No. Okay. Shoot. Okay. So you kind of all got a sense for you know, why farmers use season, the season extension and kind of the pros and cons and um, the different things. Um, I also, your assignment was to listen to one of the Farmer to Farmer podcasts. Uh, curious to see which podcasts you chose and what you got out of them. Um, Clara, I saw you nodding. So I'll just call on you so that we don't trip over each other. Yeah, I, was, I can't remember the name of it, but it was um, with a Latino farmer in Minnesota. And so like he's a first gen immigrant to the United States and then his wife is Anishinaabe. And so they moved back to Minnesota so like to be in like her homelands, but he grows like primarily um, food like that is staple in like Mexican cuisine. So like a lot of like hot peppers and cilantro and that kind of stuff. And they talked a lot. And so he sells primarily in the Twin Cities. And it was a little bit sad. He was talking about how he would really love to like market towards like the Mexican community in Minneapolis, but just because a lot of those communities are such low income is that like they can't afford the prices that he has to charge in order to remain in business. 
And so a lot of it's just going to bougie white people. So thinking about how to make food accessible to all people. Very cool. I, I want to go listen to that one now. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw Elise nod as well. I listened to the hundredth episode, so that was just like an interviewer interviewing the interviewee, Chris, and he kind of just talked about like his background and stuff, which I found relatable because he was just like a college student. He was going in for horticulture, though, but he got to intern at like a farm place, and that's really where he like started, like I don't know, catching his stride, and he eventually like became his own like farm farm owner. But it was like nice to listen to his story because I kind of feel that because I'm going to school for like animal science and I just kind of like want to work on a farm and I'm just kind of helping out right now. I don't know if I'd ever want to like own my own farm, but I really do like working on one. For sure. Yeah. I listened to the one about Nate Fingerly in Indiana. Um, and I guess like one kind of takeaway I had from it was that he's talking about how they don't have room to grow all the melons that they would like on their farm. So they partner with the local Amish population and grow the melons out there where they can let the vines really spread. And I guess I just kind of like an appreciation for that community aspect of farming. It was pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. I listened to the, the deep compost one by David Greenberg. Uh, it was definitely interesting. They didn't go too much into how they do all their practices, but they went more into how they were part of CSA and how they're a smaller farm. It focuses on the high value crops rather than trying to grow a large amount of a bit of everything. They try to just grow whatever's in demand. And they, they grow some of different crops. They, they do want to have some of everything because they are part of the CSA. But at the same time, they also want to grow to sell. Yeah. So uh, it was very interesting to listen to them talk about their deep uh, compost system. So they're fully reliant on compost for fertilizer. It's quite so, interesting. So uh, a closed loop system, then they're not bringing any fertilizer inputs from off farm? Not that I could tell, no. From what I could understand, they were just doing their own compost. Very cool. They may have been getting compost materials off of their farm, but they weren't bringing in artificial fertilizers or anything like that. I believe they were just using compost, which was very interesting. Yeah. So um, what I love about the Farmer to Farmer podcast is he's interviewed so many different farmers and um, I really want you all to get a sense for, to start to feel like you're a community, part of a community of farmers that not just here in North Dakota, but like expands the whole globe. And there's like many different approaches to farming, many different ways to succeed at farming and um, just get a sense for the diversity of farmers that are out there. Uh, Natalie, it looks like you were having some difficulties. Did you listen to any of the podcasts and did you want to share? Yeah, sure. So I got to listen to, I think it was episode 147 and it was with, um, kind of like a seed saver. He started by just growing like lettuces and selling them to like different restaurants. And then he decided that that was just too hard as he continued to get older and he wanted to focus on like saving those seeds and then selling the seeds. And he was doing like our all organic seed saving. And it was super interesting because he talked about how he would do like studies where he'd like purposely try to like have the lettuce, like get some type of like virus or bacteria on it just so that he could choose like the strongest plants. And then what was just so interesting about that was this weekend I was at a graduation party and I got to meet this plant pathologist from NDSU and he was talking about this stuff and I'm like, wait, I know this stuff. Like I was just listening to this podcast where the student is doing the same thing that you were doing. So it was really interesting. Very cool. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you've got some great resources at NDSU in terms of um, plant researchers. Mm -hmm. um, so while we were meeting, my husband brought the mail in and my t-shirts came. So if you haven't uh, seen the t-shirts, I got to take the blur off my background. Um, so this is, this is green. Is it showing up? Yes, there we go. This is the green yes, one. It's showing up. And this is the brown one. And this is the blue one. And those of you who got your orders in like a week or two ago, who was that? Natalie, I think. So a couple of you should be getting your t-shirts this week. And the rest of you, it'll be a couple weeks because I just, um, some of you just got your orders in today. And who hasn't placed their t-shirt order yet? I think just Devin, maybe? Um, I have not either. OK. Do you, um, did you get a chance to look at the uh, web, the link? To I see so, to okay. be honest. Well, you can email me your size then <laughs> so you have a chance. Um, and color. I just need to know if you want brown, green, or blue, and the size you want. Um, same for Devin, too. Those look so cool. They turned out really well. I'm really pleased with them. Yeah. And so you can wear them around and represent farms. And um, I, I really like the graphic. I'm skipping around today. <laughs> um, I want to talk about your independent projects. I also want to talk about farm visits. So let's quickly talk about those farm visits. Um, this is something new this year. I wanted you all to get to experience diverse the, the diversity of sustainable agriculture in North Dakota. And so um, in addition to the field tours that we go on as a group, um, I'd like you to visit at least one farm near you and then uh, re, you know interview the farmer ask for them to show you around and then I'll have you report back during class um, your host farmer did list some nearby farms when they submitted their application so um, I think I sent you all back those applications so that you could fill out your learning plans um, so you could talk with your host farmer about where they'd suggest you'd visit. Um, hopefully they will help make introductions and connections for you. Um, but if they don't or can't, I, I'm also happy to make introductions on your behalf. And of course, if you are comfortable, go ahead and um, make those phone calls yourself too. Um, so identify a farm near you and then contact the farmer um, either through your host farmer or through me or um, you or call them up yourself and then schedule a time to visit them um, you know make sure it's a time when they're comfortable having you out there don't just show up but I know none of you would do that um, and you know, hopefully you can visit a farm that's doing something different than what you're doing on your farm. So for example, um, where's one? Okay, Gretchen, uh, Carol said, uh, possibilities near you would be Szymanski Farms, Rognerud Farms, or Wagner's Nursery. Um, or maybe you know of some nearby farms yourself. Will we be doing a visit to Ragnarud as part of the program? We will. Okay. 
Yeah, th this was the application. She filled out the application long before we decided what the tours would be. So our July tour will be to Stable Days and Ragnarud Farm. And for Ragnarud Farm, for Haley, um, Dawn had put down as possibilities uh, Allard's Farm, Stable Days, <laughs> and A&P Hydroponics. I don't know Allard's Farm or A&P Hydroponics. Yeah, and Wagner's is like not even a couple miles from me, so maybe I'll do that one. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, do any of you have questions about that? Um, do, you, do you want help reaching out? When is that due? Anytime throughout the summer by the end of the internship. Okay. I'm kind of assuming that you guys will spread them out so then we can, you know, one by one, each one of you can report back each week during class. But if two of you do one week, that's cool too. Okay, so we can touch on that again uh, next week. Okay, independent projects. Um, so I've got learning plans from Natalie and Clara. And uh, Noreen said that you, you had done your learning plan you and she had done your learning plan, Devin, but she hasn't sent it in yet. So I'll have to send her another reminder. Um, so I'm assuming that most of you have, if you haven't finished the learning plan, you've at least had some conversations with your host farmer. Um, I guess we'll just go around the room and I'd love to hear what you are planning for your independent project. Um, Haley, since you're up on my screen, uh, do you want to go first? We had just exchanged some emails about it too. Yeah, so I am still on the fence. I have a lot of different ideas <laughs> that I want to explore, but I have to mirror it down to one. But the thing that has kind of stuck with me from the beginning is the vermicomposting. Um, I think somebody else had said it on here too, but just having something, because I am personally trying to develop somewhat of an urban farm. And that's something I can't have livestock, obviously, in this community. Um, but that's something that I can implement on my own. And it's also something that would really benefit the farm as well. Um, so that's, I think, where I'm kind of gearing towards. Are you uh, going to do an, thinking about an indoor or outdoor system? Um, it would be an outdoor system in a uh, protected area. So they have a bunch of different buildings on the farm that are free to use. So that's kind of what we're looking at right now. Great. Um, Clara, I want to hear about your mushroom project. I can do a little like show and tell oh, too, actually. Oh, great. Yeah. So um, I am cultivating mushrooms. And so it's a multi-step long process, but where I'm at right now and kind of like the first hiccup I got to. So this um, is a jar of wheat that I sanitized, hopefully well enough. This is the, this is the part where things can go very wrong when you're dealing with microorganisms. You can get the wrong microorganisms in there and cause problems. Um, so ideally what would have happened is that I would have used a pressure cooker to sanitize like the whole jar and um, all of like the wheat grain in there. So like any like microorganisms would have been killed off by the pressure, but my pressure cooker was too small for me to fit the jars in. So I had to use a process called tindalization, which is a three day process for, so every day for three days, um, I cook the jars in a water bath and just like keep it at hundred degrees for half an hour. I do that every day for three days. And it's not effective as using a pressure cooker. There are some things that can survive that process, but like it's better than nothing. So I'm really, really hoping <laughs> nothing weird grows in there. And then um, 
And then what I did after they were sanitized is that I ordered uh, these syringes full of um, sugar water and uh, little strains of the mycelium of the different varieties I'm using. And then um, you can see here, so this is called an airport lid. So there's just like an air filter. So this is wool quilt batting that can allow air passage, but not really anything else. And then this is a hole that's um, plugged with silicone. And so you can like stick the needle through it and then be able to like spray um, the liquid culture in on the grains without exposing it to the rest of the air. And then the silicone is like self-sealing a certain amount of time. So then it seals back up. Um, and so you can, I don't know if you can see, but there's like a little bit of mycelium growing. I did this Saturday. So this is only two days of growth. So then hopefully in another week or so, like this whole thing will be like coated in the mycelium. Um, and then after that point, I um, have to pasteurize straw, which will be interesting. I have to boil a lot of straw to kill off all the weird stuff in there. And then I have these big five gallon buckets with a bunch of like holes drilled in them. And then so I'll layer straw and then like sprinkle in the mycelium coated grains and make like a lasagna of that. And then, so then the mycelium will just continue growing through there and then eventually produce fruiting bodies, which will grow out of the holes in the bucket to be harvested. So I'm hoping to get at least two harvests from each bucket, so. Very cool. Um, I've never seen it like all done, do it yourself like that. I just bought the, the you know, you can buy these kits and all you do is mm -hmm. open and spritz it. So this is cool. That's, I, I love seeing the process. Anybody have questions for uh, Clara? What did you say was the base you're using in your jar? Like what, what the grain is? Mm -hmm. This is wheat berries. Yeah. Did you need a jar that big so that it was uh, enough mycelium for two buckets? Yeah, each one, each jar will just go into one bucket. I have three different variety, so a bucket of each. I don't know, this is what the instruction said, was to get a quart jar and then fill it about two thirds full. So, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, where did you get your instructions? More show and tell. <laughs> so this is like the Bible of mushrooms. Whoa. Giant. Called Radical Mycology. And so it's like, Peter McCoy. Okay. Peter McCoy. And it's like everything, like from like the physical, how a mushroom like physically works to how to grow them and how to make businesses out of them. Just kind of like the philosophy of mushrooms. Um, yeah, so I spent eight hours basically reading through that section and just all the different ways to do it. Um, I skipped the first part where you would like create your own culture. So like taking spores from a mushroom and then creating the mycelium. But you need an aspectic environment to do that in and just a lot of things can go wrong. So I just bought that part off the internet. So okay. you can buy grain spawn off the internet too, but I figured that'd be too much cheating. And that's all, it, it comes in large quantities, which was larger than the scale I wanted to do, so. Yeah. Well, great. Definitely off to a great start. Um, Devin. Uh, would you like to tell us more? Uh, um, let's start with the camelina. Would you tell us more about what you're doing there? Um, well, I didn't do that much, but I did um, go to a meeting with uh, Stephanie where they were talking about this new grain. And it's called camelina. It has a yellow flower. It looks a little bit like canola. And um, it is the kind of camelina that they were talking about was winter camelina. And it is a plant that's designed for um, it's it's designed for oil. So like uh, it the oil can be eaten or more commonly for the farmers, at least who are in this meeting. Um, used it for biofuels. But uh, yeah, we, it was interesting um, seeing what those farmers were, um, had done with camelina. 
for Noreen herself, she didn't find it that useful because Camelin as a crop looked like um, looked like it would take too much. Uh, too it, it didn't look like a crop that would grow organically well, and it also uh, did not look like a crop that um, would grow well in this area because it doesn't do well in um, harder clay soils and it doesn't do as well in um, with a lot of water, it does, but needs minimal amounts of water. So yeah, that it, it, it wasn't a great crop for her, but it was certainly interesting hearing about this new crop that they were talking about. Yeah. So the farmers that were growing it, where do they grow it? I'm not, I don't remember the exact place, but they, they grow it further down south and still in Minnesota, but further down south in Minnesota. Okay. I'm going to share my screen because I pulled it up on Wikipedia so people can see it. Um, it says it's in the Brassica family, so it's related to like cabbages and broccoli. Um, actually, I think canola might be a Brassica as well. Yes, it is. So looks like, and it's like you said, cultivated as an oil seed and grows well in cold climates. Uh, looks like it produces a fruit and seeds. Cool. Um, what else have you been up to? Um, you mentioned the the buckwheat tasting. Um, have you settled on an independent project? Um, well, the buckwheat tasting is kind of an independent project, but um, more, we've got some different projects lined up that I want to try. Another one is um, her composter currently is just like a barrel that you roll. And I was thinking about making some kind of crank setup that uh, uh that's like a stand and you crank it instead um and there's some other interesting little projects that we have planned great uh i've been wanting to make myself a barrel composter as well maybe i can learn from what you do okay uh elise I don't, you started a little later. Have you had a chance to talk about what kind of independent project you might do? Yeah, I was kind of talking about like identifying weeds and like wild bugs like in the garden because Jen doesn't know much about the weeds. She just knows to pick them. And same with the bugs. I'm like, is this a good or bad bug? She's like, oh, I don't know. So I kind of like want to look more into that. And I got this app, it's called Picture This and it helps me find like, or just identify different plants, which is it's really fun to use in the garden. Great. Um, I think next week we're going to talk about uh, pest and disease management. And so um, I think, Josh, you might have gotten to do some of this already because you've talked about scouting in the high tunnels. Um, I think I'm going to see if those recordings from the in integrated pest management seminars that DCB um, have uh, that Amy from DCB put those on a year or two ago. So I'm going to check those out to see if those would be appropriate for you all. I'm not sure how long they are, but um, so yeah, more info about that. Um, oh, which reminds, okay, so I told you about the plant, edible plant webinar. Uh, Clara, um, when you were talking about mushrooms, so Jen Skoog's intern from last year, Alyssa, um, lives not too far from Christine, North Dakota, from Family Roots Farm. And she has her own farm now. And one of the things she's working on is mushrooms. Um, she's been raising them. I think she's planning to sell them. Um, so if you'd like, I'd be happy to try to put the two of you in touch if you'd like to ask her any questions. Um, cool. Uh, Gretchen, do you chicken tractors? I'd love to hear about your chicken tractor. 
Yeah. Um, so setup on them was actually pretty easy, which is really nice. Uh, and it looks like they're going to hold up fairly well for the coming years. So there shouldn't be a lot to do there. Um, so we don't have any like feeders and waters or yet that are really good for chicken tractors because you need to move the chickens to the front of the pen or move them along with the tractors when you move them. And the easiest way to do that is by putting the feed into the feeders and then moving it and they just scoot along with it. Otherwise they can get uh, kind of caught up in the back of the tractors. And so I'm kind of between two different designs for feeders because there's one that hangs down in the center so they could access it from both sides, which would be really nice. And then there's another design that we could fill from the outside, which would be really nice because that's another trip, um, you know, that saves you a trip in and out of the tractors, prevents accidentally stepping on chickens, you know, whatever. Um, and then also working on a waterer system. Right now I'm looking at a nipple waterer that you can fill from the outside as well especially since they're going to be down in um, pastures, hopefully. I think having something that you can fill from the outside is going to be really nice because we will be filling it like with a ranger or four-wheeler kind of thing just because there's no water down there. They did have a bell waterer, which is really cool, and I just assembled that. It was uh, really interesting, but I don't think it's going to work for this because for that, you need a direct water source. Um, and then it just uses like the pressure inside of the water to fill it. Uh, but normally it would be hooked up to a hose, which would work really well, except you can't have hoses down in your pastures, you know, to that extent. So yeah, that's yeah. kind of that with that. Some great problem solving going on. Um. Okay, yeah, Josh, that's it. I, I don't think we, let's see, and Natalie too. Okay, we, I, um, let's hear from Josh. Okay, so for my independent project, April and I have pretty much figured out, I kind of wanted to do my own high tunnel and April kind of just had a spare that she didn't need for planting this season. So she's planning to just let me plant in it so that's what I've been doing a lot recently is getting it all set up, making sure we've got mulch in there. That's what I've been working on right now, but we're also still kind of figuring out where to plant stuff in there because it's it's a large high tunnel. It's 48 by 30, so it's a lot of square feet to plant in. So we're kind of thinking I'm going to do some more, not exotic, but you could say uncommon crops, some beans. Um, uh, Swiss chard. I think we're going to do broccoli in a different high tunnel, actually, but just some of the more uncommon plants you would find in a high tunnel and parched to see if they work or not. We're curious. Um, but I'm planning to uh, make a, like a, I don't want to call it a spreadsheet, but a grid by just a grid of where we're going to be planting out there. We're going to be using drip irrigation for the high tunnel and um, it's going to be mulch to reduce the amount of um, uh, weeds that we're having to deal with, trap heat in the high tunnels. It's we're, we're just trying to do our best to keep heat in, keep moisture in, and mulch is great at both of those. Better than black plastic because it is actually a renewable mulch, I mean. Mm -hmm. So we're just gonna see what works. We're planning to do more bush beans instead of long indeterminates, but we do have some, um, what's it called? Um, trellising already set up for indeterminates. So I think we're gonna do a bit of both just to see what works well. Um, trying to think of what other crops we're gonna do in there. It's mainly stuff like in our, our high tunnels this year, April's got a melon high tunnel, peppers, cucumbers, tomatoes. And I know she's got some one that's got cabbages, but that's about it. So we wanted to get a bit more variety. So she didn't need the high tunnel, so she'll let me do it. Fantastic. What a great project. 
Okay, uh, Natalie, I don't think you've spoken yet. Nope, I haven't yet. So something at like our gardens that we've been dealing with is like a lot of pests and like bugs and different things. So I was thinking something that I could do is like research and try to like execute more companion planting. We have a little bit done already, but it really hasn't been working. And we have a lot of potato beetles and bean beetles, which have not been very good. So I was hoping that I could like research and then execute companion planting in the different gardens. And then that would kind of go with like another independent project that I'm doing for the community gardens, which is like at the end of the season, I plan next year's garden. So then if I'm like, have more research on companion planting then I can implement that in next year's garden too. So hopefully we don't have as much like pests. And then that would also mean that we don't have to like spray our plants or anything like that. Awesome. Um, so two people near you who might be good to talk to. Um, Marcella's husband, Benoit, was an intern at Noreen's farm last summer, and he did a lot of companion planting um, and had some good success. So um, if you'd like, I might see if he'd want to talk with you. And sure, yeah. Uh, Ross and Amber Lockhart, um, Clara's hosts, did a project testing the efficacy of companion planting on cabbage looper moths that were eating their brassicas. And so they might be willing to talk with you as well. Sure, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for sticking around past the five o'clock end time. Um, so for next week, as I said, uh, we'll be talking about um, pest management. So your pre-work is to read the Market Gardener chapters nine and 10, um, which are about weed management and pest management. Um, you've also got some homework in your portal, uh, just a couple of readings. One is about helping little plant babies survive the heat and drought using mulch. and um, the other goes with part of your reading for this week, which we didn't get a chance to discuss about farm ownership and what that means for conservation. So um, we'll try to touch on that next week. Um, so any last comments or questions before we close? Do we have a question for our farmers this week? You know, um, I think you get the week off from a, from asking your farmer a question. I there I couldn't come up with. Yeah, you know, we've just been reflecting. So um, ask them anything you want to ask them. <laughs> Jen and I were also wondering if there's like a social media or like an Instagram website or something we can like post our pictures to, like just like connect us and show up that we're doing our work on the farm. Yes. Um, I will share Nora's email address with you so that <laughs> she can sort of coordinate that. I saw Jen um, posted a photo of you in Tagged Farms this week, and that was Did awesome. She? <laughs> yeah, so that works too. Um, but now that we have an out, a communications coordinator, I just want to coordinate mm -hmm. social media through Nora. So, um, I will make sure to connect you guys. Yeah, that'd be cool. Because I'd like to see everyone else's pictures too. For sure. And don't forget to fill out the Google form for intern spotlights. Uh, two of you have already filled it out. But so Nora, in addition to any posts you want to do, Nora is going to be doing a spotlight post on each of you throughout the summer. Okay. Well, thanks a bunch. I will follow up with an email probably tomorrow morning. Hopefully I'll see some of you either at the local food meeting tomorrow and or at the webinar on Wednesday. And I hope you all have a great week.